Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Messier and today we're having a look at a fascinating piece of automotive technology. This is the ignition coil, also known as a trembler coil or buzz coil, off the legendary Model T Ford. Now, when it comes to the history of automotive technology, ignition systems don't tend to get a lot of attention, but they are an integral part of any engine, and their design and development is well worth looking into. So, let's have a closer look at this, let me show you how it works, and how these systems evolved over time. While the first internal combustion engines, most notably those of Ed Ken de Noir and Nicolas Auto, were developed in the mid-19th century, most of these early engines did not use electrical ignition. Rather, most used what is known as a hot tube igniter, which as the name implies, comprises a metal or ceramic tube attached to the cylinder head, which is heated using an adjustable burner, so that the fuel-air mixture ignites on contact with the tube. A similar design developed around the same time is the hot bulb or semi-diesel engine, in which fuel is initially injected into a separate flame-heated bulb attached to the cylinder. The fuel ignites on contact with the bulb walls, but only partially combusts as the oxygen in the bulb is quickly consumed. However, as the piston rises and compresses air into the bulb, full combustion ensues. Once the engine starts, the heat of compression and ignition is sufficient to maintain the bulb's temperature and the external heat source can be removed. And of course, there was the diesel engine, invented in 1893 by Rudolf Diesel, in which ignition is achieved directly by compression of the fuel-air mixture, eliminating the need for an ignition system. However, glow plugs are still often used to preheat the cylinder when starting the engine in cold weather. By the time we get to the first practical automobiles, like Carl Benz's 1885 Patton Motorwagen and Henry Ford's 1896 quadricycle, reliable electrical ignition systems had been developed. The Ford quadricycle engine in particular used a very crude igniter called a make and break system, which comprises a battery, an inductive kick coil made of wire wound around an iron core, and two electrical contacts mounted inside the cylinder, one fixed and insulated and the other movable and grounded. When the piston reaches its ignition position, in this case 10 degrees before top dead center, a bolt mounted to the top of the cylinder briefly strikes the contacts, causing them to close and allowing current from the battery to flow into the kick coil. The coil stores up electrical energy in the form of a magnetic field, and when, a moment later, the contacts reopen, this field collapses and the energy is converted into a more powerful electrical pulse that causes a spark to jump across the open contacts and ignite the compressed fuel-air mixture. Now, while the make and break system worked well enough, it did have a number of shortcomings, the main one being that you couldn't adjust the ignition timing to suit different operating conditions, for example, starting the engine or operating at higher speeds. Now, later versions kept the electrical contacts inside the cylinder, but moved the operating mechanism to the outside so that the timing could be adjusted. But by this time, uh, more reliable ignition systems based on trembler coils like this one had already been developed. Now, this particular system was developed in 1902 for Ford's 999 race car, but the principle itself was far older. Indeed, it said Nenois used a similar ignition system for his Pioneer engine all the way back in 1862. So this is housed in a wooden tongue and groove box, and at the top we have a spring-loaded momentary contact known variously as an interrupter or trembler. This assembly is insulated from the brass top plate by a thin piece of cardboard and features a screw at one end for adjusting the gap between the contacts. Then on the exterior of the case, we have three electrical contact points, two on one narrow side and one on the bottom. Now we can open the case by sliding off this panel, but when we do, all we see is tar, which is poured over the internal components to secure, insulate, and waterproof them, a practice known as potting. Thankfully, however, I have an illustration here to show you what is inside. So trembler coils are basically an adaptation of the classic induction or Ruhmkorff coil, developed in the early 19th century by Charles Grafton Page, Nicholas Callum, William Sturgeon, Heinrich Ruhmkorff, and others. And we've actually already looked at these devices on the channel, since they were commonly used in medical coils for the now largely defunct practice of electrotherapy. And to learn more about that, please check out these two videos, links in the description. But whether you call these Ruhmkorff coils, induction coils, trembler coils, vibrator coils, whatever, all of these devices work on the same principle, that of an electrical transformer. Two coils of wire with different numbers of windings inductively coupled to one another. Now, if the secondary coil has fewer windings than the primary, this is a step-down transformer and it will reduce the voltage that is fed into it. If, on the other hand, the secondary coil has a greater number of windings than the primary, then this is a step-up transformer and it will increase the voltage. 
Now, the change in voltage is directly proportional to the ratio between the windings. So if the secondary coil has twice as many windings as the primary, it will double the voltage. And this same rule applies for current, but in reverse. However, electrical transformers only work when the voltage and thus the strength of the magnetic field is constantly changing, which is why they are typically used with alternating current, which is constantly reversing polarity. However, the electrical systems of early cars tended to be based on direct current supplied by a battery. So some means of constantly changing the voltage and the magnetic field was required in order to boost the voltage high enough in order to strike a consistent spark. And in the case of room core for trembler coils, this was accomplished through the use of an interrupter. Normally, this spring-loaded contact is closed, allowing current from the magneto or battery to flow into and energize the primary winding of the coil. This, in turn, converts said coil into an electromagnet, which draws down the spring contact, opens the circuit, and de-energizes the coil. The contact then springs back up, closes the circuit, and the cycle repeats, opening and closing the circuit at high frequency and creating a continuously varying voltage that allows the transformer to step up the low voltage from the magneto and battery and generate a reliable ignition spark. Now you'll notice in this cutaway diagram that this coil assembly also includes a condenser or capacitor. Now the purpose of this component is twofold. First, when the interrupter opens, a spark tends to jump across the contacts, which can quickly burn out those contacts. And secondly, that spark allows current to continue flowing through the primary side of the coil, which means that the magnetic field in that side collapses relatively slowly, and this limits the voltage that the secondary side can output. And the capacitor solves both these problems. First, as soon as the interrupter opens, current instead flows into the capacitor rather than across the contacts. And then just a moment later, the capacitor discharges back in the opposite direction through the primary coil, quickly dampening out the magnetic field and boosting the output of the secondary side of the coil. Now, since the trembler coil produces a continuous series of spark, some other mechanism is needed to time those sparks to the ignition cycle of the engine. This was accomplished using a rotating switch called a commutator, very similar to a modern distributor, which was driven by the engine camshaft to control the flow of current from the magneto or batteries to the primary side of the trembler coil. Unlike in the earlier make and break system, the distributor could be adjusted to vary the engine ignition timing. This was done using a lever attached to the steering column, which rotated the commutator cap by a series of mechanical linkages. Now, in multi-cylinder engines, each cylinder required its own separate trembler coil, which were typically mounted side by side in a wooden box on one side of the engine compartment. This box had a series of spring contacts that pressed up against these metal electrodes on the side of each coil. The system proved so successful in the 999 racer that when the Ford Motor Company was officially founded in 1903, trembler coil ignition was integrated into their first commercial vehicles, including the Model A, B, C, F, N, and of course the legendary 1908 Model T. Now it's interesting to note here that the earliest Ford cars up to the Model N had electrical systems powered by single-use dry cell batteries. Each vehicle was equipped with two banks of six cells, each bank capable of lasting between 160 and 320 kilometers or 100 to 200 miles. The idea was when one bank ran down, the driver would switch over to the other. Still, it was not uncommon for cars to stop dead mid-trip due to dead batteries, and said batteries were expensive to continuously replace. Ford partially solved the problem with the 1907 models R and S by replacing one of the dry cell banks with a lead acid battery, which, while more expensive up front, could be recharged multiple times. However, these batteries still had to be recharged at the start or end of every trip, placing motorists in much the same position as drivers of electric cars. It wasn't until the release of the Model T in October 1908 that Ford introduced an electrical generator or magneto driven off the engine flywheel to power the ignition coils, eliminating the need for batteries altogether. But while this solved one problem, it created another. The car, which at this point did not yet have an electric starter motor, became more difficult to hand crank start, since the magneto had to be spun up fast enough to generate an ignition spark. And while the obvious solution was to use a magneto to continuously recharge a storage battery, which could then be used for engine starting, this was not initially possible since the early Ford magnetos were AC alternators. These could power trembler coils and accessories like electric headlights just fine, but could not be used directly to recharge a battery. It wasn't until 1919 that Ford finally introduced a storage battery and starter motor into the Model T, creating the basic electrical system we are familiar with today. 
Now, the trembler coil system worked extremely well, especially on these older, lower compression engines that required a longer spark in order to achieve consistent ignition. And versions of the Model T tuned to run on kerosene and ethanol were also produced, which also benefited greatly from this type of ignition system. That said, the trembler coil system did have a number of issues, one of the biggest being the difficulty of achieving the consistent engine ignition timing when being run off of a magneto. Now, as I mentioned before, the early Ford cars used a magneto that was an alternator. It produced alternating current, which is continuously reversing polarity and changing voltage. Now, what this means is that at any given time, each of the four trembler coils is going to be receiving anywhere between 0 and 6 volts, and thus the output voltage is going to be varying, and at any given point, one of the cylinders might not be able to even achieve ignition, causing serious timing and performance issues. And this is exacerbated by the fact that different manufacturers' coils will have different spring tensions and other dimensional variations that can further throw off the timing. One solution to this problem was to use a master-slave system of coils. In this arrangement, the primary windings of the ignition coils were slaved to the primary of a single master coil, such that at any moment, all the slave coils received the same input voltage and thus delivered the same output voltage. This solution was adopted by a number of early auto manufacturers, but notably not Ford. Ford did, however, adopt improved trembler coils designed by Joseph Williams of the Cleveland-based KW Ignition Company, which supplied about half of Ford's coils between 1913 and 1927. Williams noticed that other coil manufacturers tended to wrap their primary windings such that the iron core protruded a considerable distance out either end of the coil. This meant that the lines of magnetic force began to curve rapidly from the ends of the coil, reducing the strength of the magnetic field at the ends of the core. This forced manufacturers to use weaker interrupter springs to compensate, not only resulting in weaker electrical contacts being made, but also causing the magnetic field strength to change at a different rate than the force of the spring, leading to uneven acceleration. A related problem was the interrupter's tendency to bounce as it struck the contact point, delaying the establishment of a solid electrical contact. Williams addressed these problems by extending the windings to the ends of the core, creating a stronger and more uniform magnetic field, and modifying the interrupter so that its spring tension increased proportionally to the strengthening magnetic field. Finally, he added a cushion spring to the contact to reduce interrupter bounds. These improvements helped KW coils become the standard for Ford cars starting in 1913. However, by the time Ford ceased production of the Model T in 1927, they had already switched over to the Detroit Engineering Laboratories Company, or Delco, ignition system developed by Charles Kettering in 1911. Now, I really should do a separate feature or maybe write a video for Today I Found Out on Charles Kettering because he was one of the great forgotten inventors of the 20th century. Among other things, he invented the first practical electric starter motor for automotive engines and one of the first primitive guided missiles, the Kettering Bug Aerial Torpedo. Anyway, in Kettering's Delco system, current from the magneto or battery passes through a contact breaker, a rotary switch driven by the engine camshaft which periodically opens and closes the circuit. When the contact breaker is closed, current flows into the primary winding of an ignition coil like this one, which is very similar in construction to the one in the older Ford Trembler system. When the contact breaker opens, the magnetic field in the coil primary winding collapses, inducing a higher voltage in the secondary coil on the order of 25,000 volts. Now, I should note here that the earliest automotive electrical systems tended to run on 6 volts, but in the 1930s, this was increased to 12 volts as engine compression had increased and a hotter spark was needed to achieve ignition. Anyway, as in the Trembler system, a condenser, one of these guys, helps the primary field collapse faster and prevents the contact breaker from sparking excessively. The 25,000 volt pulse from the coil secondary winding travels into another rotary switch called a distributor, of which the contact breaker is an integral component, which, as the name implies, distributes the current to each of the spark plugs in a desired sequence. So overall, the Delco system is broadly similar to the Trembler system, only the interrupter mechanism is a separate component driven directly by the camshaft, and the distribution of spark pulses is carried out on the high rather than the low voltage side of the circuit. Now, Kettering's Delco system was first used commercially in the 1912 Cadillac and soon became the de facto system across the entire automotive industry. Now, throughout the rest of the 20th century, several other alternate ignition systems were developed, including capacitative systems, which used capacitors rather than induction coils to store and deliver ignition pulses, as well as electronic ignition systems, which used solid-state transistors rather than 
physical commutators and distributors to achieve ignition timing. However, this video is already long enough, and that's a bit beyond our scope. Now, I've said before that this channel is not intended to be for collectors. I won't go over every single variation of these coils that were ever manufactured, because there were a lot. Uh, if you want to learn more about the gradual evolution of these coils, I have included quite a few collector's resources in the description below. But for now, I'm just going to go over the very basic overview of the design changes that were made to these coils. So the first trembler coils used by Ford are manufactured by the Splitdorf Company of New York, which also produced commutators and spark plugs. They were Ford's exclusive supplier of these components from 1903 to 1907, when they switched to the Heinz Electrical Company of Lowell, Massachusetts. In 1909 and 1910, in order to avoid a potential supplier bottleneck, Ford also began sourcing coils from the Jacobson and Brandau Company of Pittsfield, Massachusetts, and the Kokomo Electric Company of Kokomo, Indiana, which sold its products under the Kingston brand. Finally, in late 1912 and early 1913, Ford switched exclusively to the aforementioned KW Ignition Company of Cleveland, Ohio, founded and managed by Joseph Williams and William Capel. This time, Ford's solution to avoiding a supplier bottleneck was to license the KW design and manufacture coils itself at its Highland Park, Michigan factory. The very earliest coils supplied by KW are easily distinguishable in that they are larger than later coils, have electrical contact plates located higher up the body, and have a flat black anodized brass top plate. In early 1913, this design was standardized to Ford's specifications, and these new standard coils are distinguished by their taller, stamped brass base plates. One large panel of the wood case was glued in place, while the other was secured with 10 brad nails, while the brass base plate was fixed in place with 6 screws. In November 1915, Ford further refined the design to reduce the total number of parts. The box was now largely held together by tongue and groove joints, and the number of brads reduced from 10 to 8, while the number of base plate screws was reduced to 4. Ford also began potting the internal components with a tar-like compound known as Ford Hydrolene. In 1916, the design was slightly tweaked again so that one of the large panels was held entirely in place by tongue and groove joints, while the other was removable and only secured by two brads. Now, when the United States entered the First World War in 1917, many strategic materials were diverted for the war effort, including brass. So Ford eliminated as much of this material as possible by mounting the interrupter mechanism directly to the bare wood top of the coil case and replacing other components with steel. These so-called wood top coils were produced until 1919. In July 1916, Ford also began producing the so-called fiber case coils, which had cases made not of wood, but a mixture of compressed wheat gluten and asbestos. Designed to reduce manufacturing costs, these coils are very distinctive, featuring highly textured exteriors and a molded-in Ford script logo. However, this experiment was a failure. The fiber cases tended to distort over time due to heat and moisture, and production was halted in 1918. In 1919, some, but not all, coils started to be stamped with the Ford script logo on various parts of the wood case. The base screw holding the interrupter spring was also simplified to eliminate a grub screw Joseph Williams had included to adjust the spring's tension. From this point on, the spring tension had to be adjusted by tapping the rear edge of the base with a hammer or prying it up with a screwdriver. And finally, in April 1924, the two screws holding the interrupter spring to the base were replaced by rivets. And the example I have here appears to be one of these post-1924 coils, having a riveted spring and a stamped steel spring base. However, as coils produced by and for Ford during this period were not always stamped by the manufacturer, it is impossible to tell who produced this unit, KW or Ford. Now, another common variation you'll see are the tractor coils produced specifically for the 1917 Fordson tractor. Unlike its Model T counterpart, the Fordson engine was expected to operate at higher speeds and temperatures for longer periods, and so in 1919, Ford produced a more robust ignition coil to match, which were distinguished from the regular Model T units by the words tractor unit stamped into the wood case. However, producing two different coils went against Ford's philosophy of simplicity and standardization, so in September 1922, they simply standardized on the more rugged tractor variant for all their vehicles. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is a deep dive into the fascinating early history of Ford automotive ignition systems. Now, I had originally intended for this just to be a short video, but as I started researching the topic, I fell down a deep rabbit hole and knew that I had to do a more detailed exploration of the topic. So I hope you enjoyed it. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another video where we'll look at yet more automotive components and other fascinating devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jin Messier from Iron Devices. Have a great day.